Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Davidson Pattis. You said it right, thank you. you it right. Yeah, that was perfect. Let's see, I'm told this works. I'm told it works. I think we didn't put the fob in, does it work now? Yes, it does, okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for having me. Thanks for letting me interrupt your lunch a little bit. Um, if you don't like my presentation, don't throw the big rolled up heavy thing of silverware. Did anybody notice like, <laughs> I was telling the folks at my table, I've got Thanksgiving coming up, and I was thinking all the, you know, a few empty seats, I might just round out my silverware supply. Um, I'm happy to be presenting to you uh, two meals after all the beer and scotch that was drank last night, from what I understand. Um, everybody seems a little bit more with it than when I got here first thing this morning. Uh, so the, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share with you something that I think will be of interest. Um, I come to these all the time and I'm like, God, couldn't they just tell me something that's actually relevant? Um, so I'm going to strive to do that. And it's a little bit of just opening up uh, as to what we're doing, which I don't, I don't think a lot of people share their secrets of how they're approaching business and uh, figure we might as well do that. So uh, the discussion we're going to have is about an approach. People talk about disruption and, and what does all that mean. Uh, and at Fairfax, to for those of you who don't know, Fairfax is uh, a holding company, really. Uh, they own Zenith, bought us about six years ago. They own Crum and Forrester, Odyssey Re, and a variety of companies all over the world that sell insurance and uh, also other things. And the world's changing around us, always changing. You can read about it, or in our case, we decided we ought to do something about that. And so I'm going to talk to you about, about what we've done. This picture here is uh, the Fairfax Innovation Lab itself. So there's actually a physical space. I'll talk more about what that looks like and where it is and why we chose to put it where we did. Okay. Still having trouble with the clicker here. Okay. So first, first I want to talk about why we did what we did. And so uh, just a few quotes. Um, Any company designed for success in the 20th century is doomed to failure in the 21st. There's this guy, Salim Ismail, who runs uh, an organization called Singularity University. It's a kind of scary thought if you think about it. So everybody in here, me included, by the way, is working for a company that was designed to succeed in the 20th century. <clears throat> so what does that actually mean? Um, Clayton Christensen, that term that gets thrown around, disruption, he's the guy who sort of came up with that. And I think this is an interesting thing to think about. Disruption is not so much about disruptive products, but more about new business models threatening incumbents. So what does that really mean? Well, the way I look at it is what it means is that there are people out there. It's not the Jetsons car that's going to take all of our business, although Elon Musk is trying that. Uh, but this means that there are people out there trying to eat your lunch while you're doing your, your regular business. And I'm going to show you a couple of those that are having a, having a bit of a go at it. As far as uh, how we decided to do what we do, the idea that innovation works best when they operate in stealth mode. Um, there's this whole concept that if you try and be innovative in a big company, in an existing company, what they'll say is the, the white blood cells of bureaucracy will kill off any effort to be innovative. And so that gives you a little bit of an explanation for our approach to this innovation lab and the innovation working group and our whole company approach to doing this, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. Also, uh, I know at the end there's going to be some big slide that says questions. If anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand and I, I might actually uh, call out for questions every once in a while. <clears throat> so um, we looked at our business and we thought, you know, insurance is absolutely an area ready for disruption. And um, there are all these companies down here, perfect examples, right? Heavy uh, capital investment necessary to build a hotel, to get a car company going, to buy all those badges for the New York taxis. 
And what's that like? Well, it's like insurance. A lot of regulatory requirements, a lot of what you'd call like a moat or whatever that would protect you from insurgents coming in, and a lot of capital requirements. It's the same thing. And uh, you know, Uber has certainly uh, done a pretty good job of taking over that market. This isn't all doom and gloom, though. One of the messages I hope to get across is that we've got actually quite a culture of innovation. So if you're sitting there saying, OK, why is this guy telling me that you know, we're, we're going down the tubes? I don't think that's true at all. I think we have plenty of opportunity to do a great job and just have to kind of pay attention to what's going on in order to make that happen. So I love this little guy. Um, I want to share with you some of the things that I see as challenges right now. And if I see them, I'm sure there are ones out there that I, I'm not aware of. I can make, it looks like I can make him do that over and over again. Um, so when I say, I say direct challenges, uh, I know there are a lot of carriers in here and there are a number of agents as well. Uh, we're, a, we're an agent-focused business, so our company writes all of our business through independent agents. So these direct challenges are not just to the brokers in the room, they're to me as well, and it's worth being aware of. So this one, mBroker, anybody heard about these guys? They just went, are you from there? No, no okay, all right, good. Uh, I was going to say nice things anyway, but... Um, yeah, so uh, this, is a, this is one approach, and they call themselves the data-driven broker for your business, and they just went live maybe two or three weeks ago, and these are real people, right? They're, they're licensed producers, they're appointing people around the country, they're planning to do business kind of like most of the people we already do business with, except for one difference. Their appeal is that they're giving away software free of charge, and they're trying to, if you ask them, they're trying to take away the middle market, the people who don't get paid as much attention to because they're not as profitable, but they're quite profitable. And what they're offering as is value-added service. They're still going to have safety. They're still going to have claims. But in this new world, uh, they're saying essentially that the price of admission to come to the table and make a difference for your customers might be some sort of software offering. Uh, when I say they're real, I mean, the guy who runs it is a Stanford grad and uh, was on the board of directors of Hub, so he's not some guy who just came out of nowhere and said, I think I got an idea about insurance. Uh, if you take a look at their, this is on their website, like traditional brokers, we get paid commissions by insurance carriers. Unlike traditional brokers, we earn our commission. You like this guy? I'm just curious. Um, so another direct uh, threat or challenge is Berkshire's Cover Your Business. So CoverYourBusiness.com. Berkshire, uh, I sort of look at commercial insurance as being nonetheless, you know, still a fairly complex area. But uh, if you go back to that original thought of uh, disruption is taking something that already happens and, and making it better, Berkshire thinks that they can write direct. And I, I tried a bunch of these. And um, I don't know if you can see it. You'll be able to see it when it's posted on the website. But I went on Berkshire uh, Direct. I signed, tried to sign up as a uh, consultant, a few employees, no travel, no transport. And what I got was, we're sorry, we're unable to respond to your request. And, uh, but I had entered into a, you know, a bunch of information because uh, I was kind of curious to see you know, where it would go. And uh, the next day, I got a phone call from somebody saying, hey, we saw where you were on our site. And um, you know we couldn't get through the quote process. Love to talk to you and figure out um, you know what your business looks like and whether we can give you a price. What is that called? Underwriting. And so I'm I'm curious about how this is all going to play out because um, you know their 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 pitch is direct. It's not I'm, it wasn't I did not have a very complex business that I tried to sign up for, but it's out there. And as I always say, and and I know. Um, Berkshire's a sponsor here, and there's some applied people here as well. Um, you know, Berkshire's got more money than God, so they, they've got time to figure it out. Um, I was too successful. Uh, so there's another way of having a direct challenge, which I call ecosystems. And one of them is Square, the little thing that you know, goes on top of your iPhone, and you get to uh, you know, pay that way. They've already started to cut margins out of the credit card industry, but if you go on and you want to sign up as a small business, they're, they're now offering you a variety of things, payroll services, um, 
and, uh, and uh, what they don't offer is insurance. Why couldn't they do that? Why couldn't they be the single stop uh, for all of your needs? And I'd, I'd look out for that one. Probably a lot of people have heard of Lemonade, this thing, this peer-to-peer. -peer. Anybody heard of Lemonade? Anybody gone on their site? It's pretty good, actually. Their interface is quite nice. And um, I don't 100% know about their business model. Does anybody really know how it works? It's not peer-to-peer -peer insurance, really, in the strictest sense of the word. Um, what's that? Well, so, I mean, the, the real trick to Lemonade is that um, the attorney, in fact, that sits on top of it takes 20% off the top. And the, the actual, it's sort of like the farmer's exchanges when the farmer's exchanges were like real peer-to-peer -peer insurance. I mean, that was, it's not actually a new idea. Um, but their, their attempt is to pool the funds and then a group of no more than 150 people will get into that fund and they'll sponsor like a pet shelter. And the thought is there will be no fraud because if I have my big screen TV stolen, I'm not going to lie about the value because I could give 83 cents to Fido. I don't know about that. Um, we'll see how it plays out. They wrote like $15,000 of insurance in their first three days. They're only focused in New York on renters, insurance, and, and homeowners. Um, I, I did go through this one as well. Like I said, very nice interface. There's definitely something to be learned here. Very easy to use. Um, but when I got my quote and I started adding the coverages that I actually know I need, their, their offered coverages were quite low. And I said I was a homeowner rather than a renter. Um, and you know, people uh, have, have had these lawsuits before. Like, un, you know, I, I was told that I only need $100,000 of coverage when my house burned down. And so sure, I was only paying 27 bucks a month, but that's not what my house is worth. So when I started adding in the other coverages, the price tripled. Um, so uh, it seems like there's some kinks to be worked out here. So here's one I, I like to call the piggyback option. And this is where insurance is invisible. Um, Dozer is a company in Canada that's the Airbnb of heavy equipment. And uh, they basically identify contractors who have purchased these large ex excavators and, and all kinds of asphalt layers and things that can be double purpose, so they can be either a snow plow or they can be a tractor. And what they discovered, and, and these guys are contractors themselves, a lot of this very expensive equipment sits idle a lot of the year. And so they created uh, more or less a broker place to go and uh, Airbnb your heavy equipment, but they had no insurance solution. And uh, now, actually, one of the Fairfax companies called uh, Federated provides insurance for any rental uh, on Dozer. And the way it works is very simple. 5% uh, of the rental price becomes the premium. There's no underwriting. Uh, and just in its infancy, but you know, this is another direction that I could see as being sort of a direct, direct challenge to the way business is currently done. Other areas, Oscar. Uh, they do the healthcare again, very simple, very straightforward. If you take a look, it's kind of interesting. People were talking talk earlier about millennials. You notice something about all of these? I mean, this doesn't look like insurance, right? Metro Miles, another one. It's miles. Uh, you pay insurance by how far you drive. They're all kind of cartoony, and I think the intention. The same thing with Lemonade, and the same thing a little bit with Embroker. Um, they're all kind of intended to focus on a younger demographic, something a little bit more interesting. And if those statistics are correct, I mean, you know, the millennial generation, whatever they end up being or doing or wanting or, or, or how they want to work, um, no matter what, in a not too distant future, all of our retirement is going to depend on them working. And so I do think it's important to see, you know, these insights and, and again, you know, sort of keep an eye on, on what's going around in the world. So here's my question, sort of led to how we did this. What would you do to protect yourself from a 50% decrease in enterprise value in two years? This is right here, exactly, you can't maybe see it as well, but this is a chart showing what happened to the price of a taxi medallion in New York over a two year period when Uber entered the market. So everything is beautiful, right? Up, 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 you bought that medallion, your uncle bought it, passed it along to you became worth a million dollars, and now it's $570,000. So that's just the taxi drivers, though, right? There's this company that actually does the financing of medallions. So again, think about 
um, you're a broker, you're an insurance company, there are all these ripple effects that can start to happen. And this medallion finance company has seen its stock value do exactly the same thing as this. Why? Because people don't think they're going to be able to afford to pay back the amount they borrowed in order to get these medallions. So what would you do? Um, we've decided to do a, a couple of things. I've decided that this only works over here. Okay, so what I'm going to share with you now is the infrastructure that we've put in place, uh, we as a Fairfax enterprise, to try and address some of these things. And I'll, I'll tell you the principles behind it, and I'll also share with you some of the things we've done so far, just so you get a flavor uh, of what that looks like. So this is the thing we call Fair Ventures. And Fair Ventures is probably too highfalutin a name in a way because it makes, uh, it makes me think of Google Ventures and they invest billions of dollars in stuff. We don't invest billions of dollars, but um, we have made some investments. But we needed, it's not enough to just think about what's going on. You actually need to have some structure around it. And so what we did was we created um, an innovation lab and an innovation working group, which I'll describe. And with the innovation working group, I happen to be the chair of it at the moment. It'll be a rotating position, and the reason we do that is, um, well, first of all, uh, I got that nice introduction. I actually have a day job, um, and, uh, but the other thing is new ideas, and I've been doing it for about a year. I hope to do it for another year or so, and then I hope to pass it along to somebody who will say, Davidson did a lousy job. I got a lot of better ideas, and that'd be fine. Um, along with that is the actual lab. I showed you a picture of that. So in the lab, we have full-time employees. Uh, director, programmers. The pretty important thing here, some of you I know at the Blue Ribbon Conference saw Prem Watts, our chairman, a few years back. Um, this wouldn't be possible without very high level support. Prem runs the company, he owns 50% of Fairfax, and this was absolutely something that he was bought into. It's another thing to think about. You can have the world's greatest idea, but if executive leadership doesn't think it's the world's greatest idea, it's probably not going to go anywhere. So we're very fortunate to have that. Part of the team that supports it, we had to think about, okay, we, we've got this lab and we've got some ideas about what it should be looking at, but we also have all these operating companies. And so if we just have a lab where I get to go and, you know, go up to Canada and, and drink beer every once in a while, it doesn't really help anybody. So it helps me. Um, but uh, the, uh, what we created was this innovation working group. And what it is right now is 15 members of 13 companies on five continents. And so this is our bridge. This is the thing that says, okay, we got all these people thinking big thoughts and coming up with new ideas and building prototypes and identifying opportunity. How do we get that back out to the Zenus and the Crum and Foresters of the world? And, and frankly, um, the uh, companies we have in Egypt and in Vietnam and in Sri Lanka. And the answer is this group. And so that's, that's worked pretty well to actually have a, a champion embedded within the operating companies to, to take care of that. So these are the operating principles that we've come up with and how the, the Fair Ventures, I probably shouldn't have done so many animations, is really annoying. Uh, so the first thing is to develop incremental sustainable innovations. This was our starting point. The easiest, easiest to understand. We've already got something. It operates pretty well. How can we make it better? And I'm going to show you an example of one of those that we've come up with. Develop moonshot or industry disrupting ideas of our own. What would that be? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping we'll know it when we see it, but the thing that always occurs to me is that there was a time when you could have bought Google for a million dollars. I would like that. Um, so I would get to drink a lot of beer after that happened. Uh, disruption prevention. This is actually probably the, the most important thing around the area that we've been talking about, which is think about ear to the ground or putting a big megaphone up to your ear. There's a lot of stuff happening out there. And our lab people are always reading. They're always researching. So we have them looking at what are these direct challenges. We have them looking at bots, artificial intelligence, machine learning, things that can help make our business more efficient. And I'll talk to you about some of the specific examples that they are helping us with right now. Growing a culture of innovation throughout Fairfax, basically this kind of thing, right? I mean, we have the staff come from the lab and teach. Uh, what is that all, you know, what, are, what all are we doing? So the innovation working group, I kind of touched on this, foster the idea flows back to the operating companies, open doors to Fairfax, uh, advocate for the innovations, be basically champions of the things we're trying to do. So 
This is another picture of the Innovation Lab and the site. If you imagine what innovation looks like, if you, you, know, you hear me saying Innovation Lab, if you ever get a chance to go up to this location, and uh, it's uh, outside of Toronto, which makes sense because that's where our home is all exposed brick. There are all kinds of kids walking around that are starting companies. Um, there's paint all over the wall. It's a neat, it's a neat place. Uh, and it's about a thousand companies that have locations there. And that's why we chose it. Uh, partially the Fairfax location there in Toronto, ability to get there for a lot, of the, a lot of the people. But also, it's sort of a hive of activity. Here are some of the companies that are there. Um, you've certainly heard of some of them. Google, when I first started this, Google took up the top three floors of this building. They got so big that they had to buy their own building and move out. They've got like 3,600 employees up at this location. It's, they call it the Silicon Valley of the North. Um, Thalmic Labs, pretty neat. They just got $120 million funding uh, about a month ago. They do wearable devices that will allow you to control your electronics pretty seamlessly. Cool stuff. Um, and it's not just, I mean, obviously Google's a big, a big enterprise, but it's not just these sort of pie-in-the-sky things that hope they'll hit. These are the, the group or that picture I showed you earlier of our lab. This is the group of companies right around us. So, you know, Microsoft, obviously you know Deloitte, the consulting firm. General Motors right across the uh, hallway from us. Um, Thomson Reuters, big information gathering entity. Manual Life, boring old insurance company. Uh, TD Bank, T Toronto Dominion Bank. So uh, anybody know what this is? <laughs> Canadian Tire. Um, it's sort of like a Kmart of Canada, I guess. They've got all kinds of stores all over the place. I'd never heard of it, but um, it's what it is. And just in terms of the scale, this will give you a little idea of the growing investment that's going on in this area. So we've got people trying to eat our lunch right under our noses. We've got all kinds of companies that are doing things that are antithetical to our current way of business. And we've got folks who are setting up permanent locations to kind of come up with more of that. And there's a lot of money going into it. So in 2015, two and a half billion dollars was invested. It's on pace to go over that this year. These are all by quarter. This was the last year. So there's a lot of attention being paid to this area because why? Well, I mean, insurance is a you know trillion dollar plus business worldwide, and there are in uh, some places there are still some pretty good margins to be made. And so there are absolutely going to be people who are who are looking to take that for themselves. So has this worked? One of the things I said when I started doing the, the lab approach is I don't want to do this if it's just a distraction because you know, I've got a business to run, like doing it, like the people I work with. And so we challenged ourselves as a group to make sure that we uh, actually accomplish something. All right, I'm doing good on time. Am I boring anybody yet? I see a lot of people going, yeah, I'm boring you. Uh, no. Um, let me know if just you know throw stuff or something like that. Um, and if I am boring, you eat the chocolate bomb in front of you because that that looked pretty good. Um, so some of the things that we have done so far on the I would say on the softer side, uh, enhanced internal communication. That thing I, I said about uh, increasing or improving the culture of innovation. Well, we've done quite a bit of that. We've had webinars to expose people to new technologies. We've done this thing called Collision Days, which is exactly like Shark Tank. We have people come in for 18-minute presentations. We have 25 companies come in a day. This is what I got them. You know, this is like actually a lot of you could do this in your businesses, and I would recommend it. If you're anywhere near a place where there are these kids, right, coming up with these new ideas, tell them what you want to hear about. They're very eager to tell you what they're doing. So um, I was up in Canada uh, doing a, a second collision day just a, a month ago, and I had a, a, a young person come up and, and a new solution for SMS payments, so text message payments for your policy. I had somebody come up with... Um, a, a, a shirt and a pair of gloves that can prevent or at least largely reduce back injuries. And this was all because we said, hey, we're Fairfax. You might think we're boring, but we're actually, you know, we need a lot of things. And people come in the door and they've got analytics. Um, they talked about blockchain uh, and its potential applicability to the insurance business. So a little secret maybe is that just like I'm happy to share this information with you, there are a ton of people out there. You don't have to read. If you just put a little sign out and say, I'm interested, I might become a customer, I might become an investor, I might find something that 
uh, I would like to, uh, you know, participate in, they'll flock to you. So another thing the lab staff has done is company visits. Um, they've gone out and uh, even though we have the innovation working group to try and be that bridge, the lab staff, because they are full time, have been able to go out and say, let me show, let me share with you what we've done. That's gone well. We've created a bit of an, uh, our own technology infrastructure. We've got a wiki like, um, like Wikipedia, not like WikiLeaks. Uh, where we're able to share what's going on. They blog about the happenings in the lab. We post everything up there. It's becoming sort of our library of possibilities. And uh, I think actually if you wanted to, you could go to fairventures.ca and see the site. It's, it's listed right up there um, if you're at all interested in seeing. It'll have some externally facing stuff. Some of it is for us internally, but it's kind of interesting. So things we have accomplished. Um, we started out by uh, all these you know, people from the companies coming together and uh, putting together problem statements. Problem statement being, hey, I'm a company based in New Jersey or based in Los Angeles or, or based in Cairo and I have needs. Needs that maybe a group of people who are focused on what the future holds and are talking to tech companies could help me satisfy. So service capabilities, I listed a couple of the companies that mentioned this, Zenith, Redwood, some of you might deal with, Hudson's another large Fairfax entity. And we're always trying to figure out how can we better convey what we call the Zenith difference at Zenith, and I'm sure at Hudson they call something, something else, cross-selling. It's ironic in a way, uh, Fairfax is this large, far-flung enterprise, uh, but Prem believes very strongly in decentralized operations. So, bless you. Uh, so we could have opportunities to interconnect our businesses, but that requires some sort of dialogue. Well, could we enable that with technology in some way? Could we list out the companies that we work with? So we're, we're thinking about that, micro sales. This was a real revelation to me. Um, we have, I said five continents. Well, North America and Western Europe are one thing. Uh, everything else is completely different. So what I perceive as the needs of insurance companies are absolutely not the same in what I'll call developing country companies. So they're very successful. Um, we have a, a pretty big business in Africa, but what they need is mobile enabled. They need micro insurance, which literally means you, know, you get on your scooter and the accelerometer in your phone knows you're moving and at that, that point in time, you begin to be charged for the insurance product and not while the car is just sitting there or the scooter is just sitting there. Um, in a lot of these countries, uh, folks, there's a high degree of illiteracy. And so you need to be able to present whatever you're going to give to people in, in, in icons as opposed to in words. So this has been eye-opening in that regard as well. Some of the other things we touched on, opioid abuse. You think, well, what does an innovation lab have to do with that? Well, we put out a little note saying we wanted to learn about, you know, everybody he hears about this now in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the opioid epidemic and all that. There is a company that actually has used genome mapping to figure out whether you're likely to become addicted to opioids and maybe not give you that opioid or maybe give you an alternative. And they've also, through that discovery, we found that they have a similar process that will say you're on this medication. This medication is patented still. There's a generic that's equally or maybe more effective for you. And things that we didn't even expect are coming to bear. I mentioned, I'll just jump over to the, to the collision day. Is there a question? I was hoping. Would anybody like to ask a question? Okay. No, all right, good. Um, so some of the things that we, uh, we saw in these initial startups, we saw healthcare, Internet of Things, this IoT, everything is connected, and I'll, I'll share with you one of the things that, that we're doing. Geospatial, drones, everybody talks about drones. What are drones useful for? Well, I'm not sure anybody really knows yet. Um, they're a cool toy, but I, another aspect that we have is mapping out the topography of the properties that we insure for several reasons. Uh, on the workers' comp side, if you're picking grapes at a slope, you're more likely to get injured. In our property business, aside from workers' comp, we're very concerned, as all companies are, about fire exposure. So you gotta see, you know, would the fire department be able to get into this area? Can we make sure, can we you know, use the drone technology to get out there? Fairfax just purchased a couple of uh, really high quality drones, and we're gonna experiment. Do we know where it's going? No, not 100%. Another area, 
uh, is in the Middle East. Uh, our, uh, our London exchanges, the, the uh, Lloyd's exchanges, they write terrorism insurance, and uh, it's one of the things that's kind of not known is that the place where the product is most needed is the hardest to sell it, because you can't get anybody there. So in Syria, a business could really use terrorism insurance and, and, and so forth. And it's possible that um, the drone technology will be able to take the place. Because somebody says a building blew up, how, I have no idea, right? But if you can have somebody you know, 10 miles away piloting something, maybe we can get in there in a way that we wouldn't be able to and sell more insurance. Now, I'm hoping the buildings don't blow up, of course. Everybody's like, yeah, well, would, why would, yeah. I can see what you're thinking. Um, but in any event. Um, wearables, and, and, and what we ended up with is we call these tiger teams. We came up with some that we thought, yeah, you know, those are, those are areas of interest. So one of them was Dozer, I mentioned to you earlier, and uh, Fairfax actually bought 20% of that company. And we liked their model, and we knew that we're looking for what we call win-wins, where we've got a company that has a quite compelling founder, it looks like a good business model, it's growing, it looks like it's got some running room, but not just as a venture capitalist. That's not what we're really about. We're not private equity. We're not looking to flip companies. But we were able to do this one where we, are, we provide the insurance for them as well. So we're growing our own market organically. And by the way, we think it's a pretty good company. MindTech is a company that we're, we're still talking with. They have, uh, cure is probably too strong a word, but a uh, technology that remediates uh, upper extremity paralysis. And they've got some quite compelling uh, videos of people who they don't they're not they're not perfect again but it mimics uh, the nerve motion or whatever the I can't, I'm not going to describe this the right way but um, our doctors are looking at it and if you think about it first of all it's a good person kind of thing to do I mean if we can help this company grow it actually will help people the other thing about it from purely a workers compensation perspective is uh, you, you know a quadriplegia or a tetraplegia claim is extremely expensive and if I can get somebody to be able to feed themselves and measure out their own medication and use a wheelchair instead of having to have 24 7 care it's obviously better for them and it's clearly better for me. So think about, again, how can technology impact our existing business? Um, a Flexo is the one I mentioned to you I saw just the other day. Um, this is the one with, and the, 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 the person who brought this to us is a fourth year student at the University of Waterloo. He's developed a, uh, a working prototype and I don't know how he came up with this idea of mitigating back injuries, but it's obviously, it's a huge area for our industry and I mean, he looked like he was 12 years old, as far as I could tell, but he had all this technology. He's built a dashboard. And so I put him in touch with our safety and health professionals, our engineers, and like, yeah, this is a possibility here. So again, it's that you know, ear to the ground, what can, what can happen? And you know, if we're able to do this, it could put us in a better place in terms of helping injured workers. So all, all good. So that's the idea generation sort of phase of what we've done. Things we have accomplished. Uh, and Circle. It's, uh, a company that is, was founded by a guy who sold his last company to Google, and it's a much better integration of video and photography with voice dictation in the field. So for us, we're using it for uh, pre-inspections for underwriting purposes. We're just piloting this right now. Uh, for Northbridge, if you saw this, they had the largest natural disaster in Canada at the Fort McMurray fire. And they used this technology to immediately get information back to the claims adjusters. People's houses had burned down. And obviously, you've still got to you know, determine compensability and, and coverage and so forth. But they were able to turn cycle time down by about 70% using this. So you know, good for the customer. Also good for us, honestly, because if Northbridge can be seen as an innovative company that pays legitimate claims right away, what's going to happen? Hopefully, they'll get more business out of that. Um, the Rogers Group, we've used geospatial, uh, the, the incredible amount of detail you can get out of satellite photos now allows you to do things differently. So we've begun to look at writing a domestic terrorism product and using this kind of technology to try and pinpoint where we would uh, be able to mitigate loss and obviously hear about this um, all the time, unfortunately, now. Uh, claims Portal. Uh, I'll show you some screenshots. We're building out a, an injured worker portal, which as far as I know, I know there are some companies that have 
uh, tried to do this, and uh, I'm not sure that they are as successful in terms of understanding what the injured worker wants. The lab helped us with this. They, they have this process they call storyboarding. So we went up there and they're like, well, what do you want this to do? What do you think your customer wants? We did some focus groups, and we used that to fairly quickly build a technology platform, which we'll have out live to um, a pilot group of our injured workers starting in December. And uh, obviously, we've been following up on some of these others, MindTech, Alert Labs, Dozer, that I told you about. Ah, so this is Zenith Assist. I mentioned the, the portal. And these are screenshots from uh, basically our, our test product. And what will happen now is an injured worker will have a claim. And what we heard their frustrations, they're pretty simple, actually. Can't reach my adjuster. Don't know what doctor to go to. Um, you know, I can't keep track of my medication. I don't know when my appointments are. And, and I'll tell you, one of, the, uh, one of the reasons for doing this is I, I took a look. It wasn't just a, it was a, first it was a gut instinct. But I looked at some data. And what I found is we're spending millions of dollars extra on claims costs when people miss doctor's appointments. And well, why would that be? Well, there's a few reasons. One, sometimes the doctors charge us anyway if the person doesn't show up, sort of a cancellation fee. And we feel, to some degree, obliged to not upset them. And so we pay them because we want them to see our patients going forward. But the other thing is a missed doctor's appointment or a missed physical therapy session ends up extending the claim. How can I mitigate that? How, push notifications. I mean, Travel Zoo is sending me stuff all the time. Uh, you know, Groupon tells me when you know, I can save eight cents off of my car wash. Why wouldn't I tell the injured worker, hey, don't forget, tomorrow is your doctor's appointment. And if I can just carve into that a tiny little bit, um, that'll be a huge win for us. Uh, and this will help us do it. And it's going to, you know, for an insurance company, I think this is actually fairly innovative. Uh, for, for a, a workers' compensation company, we're going to have the Touch ID on, on, it actually is on my phone now, and uh, we're going to have notifications, the push notifications, it'll work on the Apple Watch. And one of the big things that people ask for, they want to chat with or text with their adjuster. But all of us are working on our, you know, these archaic legacy systems, and no adjuster wants to give their personal cell phone to a, claim, uh, to a claimant, right? Um, and so we've built into the app the ability to have real-time back and forth, and instead of going into your phone, it'll go directly into our claim system. And one of the things that we're working on, so that's, that's live, ready to go. Um, one of the things we're working on, I mentioned earlier in the lab, is helping us with this is bot technology. Um, basically a chatbot. And uh, what we're planning on for one of the next releases is there are a lot of things that injured workers ask for that are pretty straightforward. Where's my check? When is my next doctor's appointment? Things we actually have in data that, A, don't require you to talk to an adjuster, and uh, it can make the adjuster more efficient. It can happen like that. So um, we've got a cute little B, the B bot. Um, that people have come up with. I don't know if I like that. Anybody, want any reaction? You like the B? Okay, yeah, Greg's, Greg's not, and that's great. Um, I got one vote for that. And what we learned, one of the, probably other people know this already, don't lie to people and make them try and think it's a real person talking to you, because they get really angry about that when it turns out not to be, right? You know, it says, like, you know, I'm Jose, I'm your claims adjuster. No, you're not. And, uh, so we'll design it so that it'll answer a bunch of questions, but at some point it'll say, you know, geez, I can't help you with that. I need to get your adjuster on the line. Please wait. Or the adjuster, it's, you know, 9 o'clock at night, and we'll get back to you um, no later than, you know, the next business day. So that's uh, to be released very shortly. Closing comments, because uh, I know we've got to get to dessert as well. And, and there'll be, a, there'll be a, a few minutes of closing comments. So... Um, Think about your questions. If I stand up here and there are no questions at all, I'm going to be very disappointed. Would you like to ask a question now? Fantastic. So thank you for that question. The question was, I said badges. Am I thinking about gamification? Um, this is not that. This is just to show that, hey, you have a message, so it'll be the push notifications. I am actually thinking about gamification. Um, did you have something in mind about that?
What would you what would you do? What would you incentivize? Well, uh, not missing doctor's appointments, exercise, weight control, you know, some of the things the working on comorbidities possibly. I you know what you know what occurs to me? Mm. Not getting a lawyer. Well, yeah. Uh, well, the the thing is um, our 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 litigated claims even severity adjusted, so you take the same ICD-9 or now ICD-10 code, when they're litigated, they're five to seven times more expensive. And we all have people in the industry here talk about the LA effect. It's much worse in certain parts of the state than in others. Um, but the, 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 the bad thing about that is the injured worker doesn't really get much out of it. The amount of permanent disability they get is minuscule over what they would have gotten for the same claim. Every other benefit is just going to the doctor's office, so that doesn't really help them at all. If they would have gotten better sooner without legal counsel involved, for whatever reason, um, then it's really not an advantage to them to be out of work longer. The temporary disability payment, is, it's just two-thirds of their pre-injury loss, so they're not getting rich off of that either. Um, so the only thing that they're really getting out of it is a slight increase in permanent disability. So uh, I would say there are probably things that you could do to incentivize folks not to go down that pathway. Partner with me instead of somebody else in your own recovery, and then we'll both benefit from it. So out of a question about badges comes the discussion. Thank you. So closing comments, in a way. Um, perhaps. There we go. So adjusting to a changing world. Um, you know, is this just a flash in the pan? Is it just going to go away? Um, I would say no. And there's a whole lot of reasons. I mean, once you get progress going, it's a little hard to stop. And, and there are people out there, I've already I shared with you half a dozen of them, that are trying to find a way to, what they would say, improve our business model and do it in a way that takes, uh, takes market share away from us. The other thing is, you know, I say permanently question mark low interest rates, uh, but the interest rates are quite low. There are a lot of people who believe that there'll be deflation. Um, we've seen some signs of inflation, but it's pretty tepid. Wages aren't going up very, very quickly. And uh, although the Fed would like to raise interest rates, right now it's still stuck at a quarter percent. <coughs> Excuse me. So maybe they'll raise interest rates a bit later this year, but the, the long-term 10-year rate is like four plus percent. And when it was like that, there were relatively low-risk ways an insurance company could collect premium and get a 7, 8, 9% return. That's not the case and hasn't been the case for a long time. And it might be quite a while coming because the degree of debt we have in our country compared to our gross domestic product is at a very uh, historic high right now. And that's gotta, something's got to happen. Uh, and deleveraging is probably what's going to happen. So, so what does that do? Um, I think we all experience this in one way or another. Excess capital. There are pension funds that promised their people they were going to have a payout when they retired, and they needed to make seven to eight percent on that pension fund in order to on their on their investments in order to make that happen. You can't get that money. So, I see, and you probably do as well. Lots of the new entrants into the marketplace, they think they can get a return on insurance. And it's, it's in reinsurance, there are now cat bonds, there are people uh, you know, issuing those as opposed to just normal reinsurance entities. I see it in the California marketplace where um, all kinds of companies you know, demutualized in one state and decided that they were really a California company um, and uh, are trying to grow that way. So, the, as we get these new market participants, you're going to get these challenges. <clears throat> and at the same time, some of those things that I sort of poo-pooed earlier about barriers to entry, they still exist. It's not easy to create an insurance company. Uh, significant regulations and capital requirements. There are relationships that are exceedingly important. I'd like to believe that the brokers and agents in, in the room uh, still care about that. I know that we do as a carrier. And I'm pretty sure that the agents, because that's the basis of your business, care about that too. How do you come into a market and take market share if you don't know the people you're trying to do business with? And just my example earlier, Lemonade was a very simple one. Uh, but to purchase, purchase, 
Insurance is not a fungible item, in my view. Now, it's easy for me to say as an insurance company executive, but maybe it is if you get auto insurance, maybe. Um, but I'd still rather have a better carrier than a worse carrier. And when you get into anything like covering your business or what those coverages are, what do you need? What exclusions are there? Do you need a waiver of subrogation? Do you need cyber insurance? All these things are pretty serious intellectual endeavors. Going online to do that might be hard. It might be a little while before that, before that takes, uh, takes effect. And the CEO of Oscar in January of 2016, he said in an interview, somebody trying to get into this, his way, this was his way of describing why it'd be hard to take their business, but I thought it was telling in this regard. He said, in order to get into the business today, it would take you two plus years. It would be 2018 before somebody could start trying to take over their business area. So, and I think there's something to be said for that. I met with those guys from Mbroker just out of curiosity. It was quite some time ago. They'd been together for a while, and it still took them another six months to get up and running in, in sort of a beta phase. Um, the other thing is profit's not guaranteed. So there are all these ideas out there, uh, and we're absolutely trying to listen to them, but you know, last I saw, Uber had lost a billion and a half dollars in, in the prior quarter, and Oscar is now pulling out of the healthcare exchanges because they're losing money on it. So a lot of these whiz-bang ideas. Anybody heard of Zenefits? So you know, there's, a, there's another good example, actually, where all of these things, for those of you who, who didn't hear about it, Zenefits decided to sell insurance without a license, essentially. They, um, they, they had their, their, their brokers or people who should have been licensed as brokers cheat on tests, and their enterprise value dropped right away. Um, and they're struggling back. They're trying to rebuild trust. But those regulations, those, those sticky little things that are made to protect consumers actually matter. And um, so it's, it's not always going to be simple to just take our business away from it. Um, at the same time, and this is sort of the message I hope to get across, is that um, we, you know, we absolutely have vitality left in, in what we're doing. And actually, I think we could be the future. There's no reason that because we were built for the 20th century, we can't succeed in the 21st. But we're going to have to do something to make sure that that happens. And being aware, the sharing economy is real. People, uh, I'm going to New York with my daughter in April, and I'm not going to stay at a hotel. I'm going to stay in somebody's apartment for Airbnb. It's much larger. It's much cheaper. My daughter says I snore. I'm sure that's not true. Um, I lost a lot of weight recently. So you know, I think my, you know, the snoring thing has kind of dissipated, right? I look pretty good, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. That's my favorite part of the, uh, of the uh, show today. Um, so one of the things we're doing, sensor technology, the Internet of Things, where you can know what's going on, and you can, we could probably sit here and think of 50 different uses for this. One that kind of um, we're working on, we ensure a lot of standing hay. Doesn't sound very sexy, right? Doesn't sound like something that would be a, a problem. Well, anybody know what the problem is with hay? Yeah, it spontaneously combusts. Which do you know? Do you know how it burns? Do you know what causes that to happen? Yeah, moisture, pressure, and temperature. And when those things come together, then the thing just catches fire. And any, any, anybody want to guess what a, so a, a typical haystack that we're insuring is like 20 by 20 by 40 feet. What does that cost? Uh, it's a little less than that. It depends on uh, the, the market. But like 100 grand, maybe a little bit more. And when it starts to burn, that's it. I mean, there's, you know, you're not out there with a hose. It's not going to happen. And what's that? What's that? <laughs> put it out with kerosene? Once you soak it, there, there are things that will put it out in terms of uh, like the fire retardants and so forth. But, um, but once you douse it with kerosene, the cows don't like it as much. Uh, anyway, so we're working with um, a number of companies that, build se that have sensor technology. And these things used to be quite expensive. And now you can actually embed sensors in that will detect using algorithms. It doesn't have to touch everything, but it'll figure out, here's a hot spot, like you said. Here's something that's going on. And so we're going to try and mitigate loss by leveraging these things that <clears throat> used to be quite expensive. Um, advances in life sciences. I mentioned this earlier, this mind tech company. Uh, and uh, can we actually find a way to make people better that was, we thought was never going to be possible? So we're working on that as well. So, you know, what is, what is my answer, or what I guess would I like everybody to think about, that change is inevitable, 
Um, I see, and kind of hinted at this, the product that we all sell, whether whatever different lines, we're all affording somebody, I think insurance is kind of a noble calling. People talk about what draws the millennials in. I think if we articulate what insurance is the right way, it should draw everybody in, because enterprise isn't possible without risk mitigation. And so if you think about well, what allows you to build houses and hospitals and roads and have schools, those things, those large conglomerations of capital wouldn't happen if you couldn't spread the risk around. So I actually think what we do is important. And if we're going to keep the reins in our hands of that, we're going to have to adapt. And some of it is this technology uh, aspect of it. If, I like this quote. I'll just end with this and then see if there are any other questions about the future. Um, the future's here. It's just not evenly distributed. And so that thing I said at the very, very beginning, that disruption is just taking your, our business model and making it better, that's happening. And what I tried to share with you over the last 40 minutes or so is the approach that Fairfax has taken to try and be aware. That's all it really is, right? Be aware, leverage it, try and have some accomplishments so that we're not just up there in Canada um, talking to ourselves. And uh, hopefully I've showed you a few things that have actually worked. And maybe uh, this will be one of the more interesting uh, sessions that you have. I know there's going to be a survey. I feel like the guy at the Ford dealership, please give me 10 stars uh, or whatever that is. And with that, I will see if there are any questions. Sir. Yeah, so the question is, is it an industry push? Um, so I was at a, a big eye day up in Northern California, and I was invited to talk, but there was also the guy who runs the Chubb Innovation Lab and the AIG Innovation Lab. Probably Liberty has one. Um, we all see the commercial for farmers. They've got one with uh, you, know, the, the, you know, the dust bunnies and all of that. So no, I mean, it's not an industry as a whole, but it definitely feels like the weight of direction is headed in that in that way. And, and one thing I'll share with you also, there's this group called the, the Hanover Group, and they did a survey of what brokers are doing with their money, with their technology money. And I, I thought it was an interesting one and, and kind of a cautionary tale. What it shows, and I've got the report if anybody's interested, but uh, that the large brokers are investing in stuff like this. The small brokers and agents, and partially it's a, it's a question of capital, and, and I know you all see consolidation in your market, um, they're investing in things like buying a new computer or getting the next version of their software. It's hard uh, to pay for the things that can be truly leading edge, but people are absolutely doing it. And that's another thing I would say about the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's also not evenly affordable. Mr. Norwood. So John wants to know if there are things we're doing to make life easier for the broker. Um, I, I'd say yes. There are a couple things that um, we heard over and over again that we need to provide more risk management information system kind of approaches. And we've been busily working on that. Um, and the way we've done it is quite organic. We've gone to some of our larger customers and some of our larger agent relationships and said, um, OK, tell us everything you want. And we just started to build it into our systems. And then something that we'll be coming up with in the not too distant future is personally branded websites for individual customers. Um, we're still going to always sell through brokers. So that's not a play of like, how can we get that customer to just care about us? We're not going to do that. But I think, yes, because I would like to believe that um, we're the best workers' compensation company you can get. And I'd like our brokers to believe that, and I'd like them to be able to sell that value proposition because I believe we'll do a better job for the injured worker and for the employer. And so if I can make our broker's job easier to explain that value proposition and say, Zenith does these things, yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. I know that sounded like a lot of like an advertisement, didn't it? Sorry. Question in the back?
Well, I mean, so the question is about advertising and whether that's really changed. For some companies, yes. Um, for us, really no, because we still sell through independent agents and brokers. Um, so our advertising is, for the most part, to people in this room. Um, we're pretty simple, and, and maybe we should change, but our, our approach is do a good job, do the right thing, form the relationships, bring a value product at a reasonable price, not always the cheapest. Um, it's In order to create enough notoriety around something like a duck or a gecko, it's pretty expensive. So it'd be a long pathway before we'd get a return on becoming, you know, aflac of workers' compensation. So that's not our approach. And as I mentioned, Fairfax operates decentrally. So although it's a large enterprise in and of itself, each one of us is not that big. The biggest company is still pretty substantial. It's about two and a half, three billion dollars a year in premium, but um, it's nothing like a Geico. Any other, any other questions? I'm going to be driving back up to LA, so if anybody wants to come with me, you can ride, ride shotgun and I'll answer whatever you'd like. All right, well, thank you very much for your time.